Okay, so my name is Geth, and we are here with the Saturn H03, and we are going to be launching a space station. Uh, in particular, we're going to be launching Space Station Freedom, uh, with the first core module, which under the fairing there, is the Challenger module, which is going to serve as the habitat and service module for the entire station. Um, now, as the video goes on, I am recording over it, so, uh, yeah. But, um, anyway, basically what you're looking at is the Saturn H3. Uh, this rocket is from Eister and Skyward, and what it is, it's derived from the Saturn V uh, Apollo heritage, and basically it uses uh, three F1A engines to lift itself in the air and carry its payload elsewhere. Um, what you're also looking at with the second stage is what's called the S4C, uh, which is an S4B that's stretched and also uses a much improved J2S engine. Now, as you see, it just uh, completed its role program. Uh, now, in Kerbal Space Program, you don't need to actually do that. You can just launch straight in this configuration you're seeing here, and it'll work just fine. Uh, but that's no fun, and more importantly, uh, it's not how it would happen in real life. It would be oriented in a certain way, because that's what, how it would have had to have been stacked. And, um, yeah. Then ultimately it just looks cool seeing the rocket actually roll like that, so that's why I do that. <coughs> now, something I am going to note, as most of you probably have noticed, I am using MechJab for Ascent Guidance. Uh, not because I can't play the game, but simply just because I I've been playing this game for so many years now, and I spent so much of that time doing nothing but launching stuff in the low curve and orbit, or low Earth orbit, as the case is with this particular game. And uh, it's just no fun. Uh, you know, I miss out on a lot of the meat of the game, because by the time I get done putting something into space, I don't feel like playing the game anymore. And that's, that's not cool. That's not fun. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, we're going pretty well. I'm showing you the entire launch so you can see how the Saturn HO3 actually works. Uh, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's basically similar to how the Delta IV Heavy works in real life. Um, it'll uh, go at full throttle pretty much for the first part of the flight. And around the time when the thruster weight ratio hits around 2, going to see the throttle drop off a little bit. Uh, now, in Kerbal, I couldn't really replicate that, but also have MechJab handling a sin. Uh, so what I did instead is I added a little bit more fuel to the core stage, and the outer cores are yeah, still fully fueled, they just have a little bit less fuel. Um, and what you'll see once we get to booster separation is the boosters will separate, and the core stage will only just have enough fuel left after that um, to burn for, I believe it's like 20 seconds. At that point, it's jettisoned as well. And uh, ultimately, it works out really well. It's a very good rocket. Um, you know, it performs pretty much exactly as uh, it's supposed to, uh, which is really impressive. You gotta really hand it to Eve Pie and Orton Goblin for really working that out and presenting a rocket that it was not only feasible just from a theoretical standpoint, uh, but also from a practical standpoint, could have worked very, very well if it was ever actually built. Alright, now we're just hit Mach 1.8. You're starting to see the arrow effects here. Uh, in Kerbal, the arrow effects, they're a little weird. Uh, the actual um, sound breaking part of it, what you're seeing now, isn't very pronounced unless you're going like extremely fast, which of course isn't how it actually works in real life. Uh, but at the same time, as you'll see a little bit later on when we get to where the rocket's going to experience shock heating, as it would in real life, the effect is really exaggerated. Uh, so it's kind of a uh, catch-22. The actual aero effects are under-modeled, but then the heat effects are over-modeled. Uh, it's kind of a limitation of Kerbal because this is at a stock scale, uh, which I believe is like 10 tons, like, uh, what is it? less than like 10 times the size of Earth or something like that. It's very, very tiny for our planet, yet the atmosphere is still relatively that tall. Uh, and that, that obviously causes problems. 
I mean, as you can see, we're starting to get shock heating there. You wouldn't actually see that on a rocket like this because the thrust to weight ratio is so low. And yeah, the only rocket you would ever see go through something like this is something that's really going like a bat out of hell. And these rockets don't do that. They're really, really slow for what they are, and they take a long time to get out of the atmosphere. Uh, now we're coming up on booster separation. Uh, as you'll notice with the gravity turn MechJeb is performing, uh, we're not really getting a lot of horizontal speed. Uh, this is actually on purpose. Um, Efficiency-wise in Kerbal, this isn't a good idea, uh, just because you're wasting a lot of fuel for it. Uh, but at the same time, realistically speaking, it, it works out, because yeah, there's booster separation. But um, I anyway, th this works out realistically because you're actually seeing the rocket in a profile that it would actually launch into. Uh, most of the time when this rocket is accelerating, it's going to be at a horizontal angle, and most of the acceleration is actually going to be done by the S4B once it um, ignites here in just a moment. And that's why this video is actually relatively long. Most of it is actually just spent accelerating the rocket forward. But uh, yeah, ultimately I like it. You know, it takes a long time to get something up into space, but at the same time, that's how it's supposed to be. It's not just a quick two minute ride into space. Yeah, see, it, look, look how pretty that is. Yeah, I spend a lot of time building these rockets. More importantly, I spend a lot of time building these rockets when we didn't have parts from Blue Dog Design Bureau. Uh, yeah, back when it was just like FASA and whatever else we could cobble together. And, and back then I spent so much time not only just building the rockets so that they looked right, but also launching them over and over and over again to get the ascent profile right, uh, to get the staging right, set up um, how the oolage motors work, how the separation motors work, perfect for that. I, I did a whole lot of stuff and at, at this point I've built not only the original Saturn rockets, but also the Ice Turn Sideward uh, Saturn rockets so many times that I I've got it ingrained in my memory. I will probably remember how to build these rockets until the day I die. Uh, I've just built them over and over and over again. Uh, and that's also why the fairing you're seeing there is also um, almost exactly what that fairing would look like in Ice Turn Skyward. Uh, you can even look at one of Nixon Head's renders of the HO3 and that, that's almost the exact shape of that fairing. And it's also the exact same diameter, relatively speaking. Uh, it's just about double the size of the S4C, uh, which is normal. Uh, in real life, if I remember correctly, the S4C would have been a 5 meter diameter. And then the actual fairing itself, which in this case is called the wide body fairing, it would actually expand out to 10 meters at its um, uh, uh, biggest diameter and then come back on itself. Alright, so, we are accelerating, and it is taking its time. Uh, with the S4C, as you'll notice, the thrust to weight ratio is fairly low. Uh, this, again, is also on purpose, not very efficient uh, in terms of the Kerbal Space Program, uh, but still realistic and ultimately exactly what the specifications for the actual rocket would have been. Uh, thrust to weight ratio at sea level, I believe, uh, was supposed to be 0.69 when fully fueled and presuming a maximum load as we are here. Uh, the Challenger module that we're going to be seeing here in a moment once I jettison the fairings, uh, it's supposed to be in the timeline 77 tons, uh, which is pretty much the exact max weight to uh, low Earth orbit that the Saturn H03 can do. Um, and Kerbal, um, I've got nearly up to there. I had to scale it down a bit. It's around 60 tons, I believe, uh, which is still fairly heavy. And yeah, and ultimately that's what I had to do. And it's still realistic in a scaled down game. All the masses are going to scale down too. And 60 tons is, is around where it needs to be. Alrighty. And just keep on accelerating. Yeah, mo most of with this, uh, you'll notice that it looks like I'm only just barely making it out of the atmosphere. Uh, and you'll even notice with the estimated um, exit atmosphere, uh, for a while there, it was actually showing 
uh, where I would re-enter at some point, and I wouldn't actually be able to get out of the atmosphere. Uh, but that's fine. Uh, if you watch the periapsis readout up there in the top of the left, uh, it's slowly going up and up and up. And as soon as it actually hits 70 kilometers, which is my apoapsis right now, that's when it, the apoapsis is going to start shooting up. And that's how we'll get out into space. And yeah, that, that's fairly realistic. We're pretty much completing the end of the gravity turns, and now we're just building up all that horizontal acceleration so that be able to. Um, get into space, obviously. Uh, yeah, I believe I'm about to jettison the fairings here. Yeah, I, I am uh, recording over myself playing rather than talking as I do it. Uh, this is because, uh, due to my living situation, uh, it's very hard to play the game and also talk over at the same time. But there the fairings go, and you're getting your first look at the Challenger module that I built. And there goes its panels. Uh, what it's doing is it's extending all of its antennas as well as the two um, uh, keep alive solar panels. Uh, those are obviously to keep the station alive until the first set of trusses can come into uh, come in the dock with it and you know start providing it power. And that'll be like that for about a month, I believe. Uh, yeah, I'll stay up there for about a month with just these panels. Uh, after this, the first node, which in our timeline was called Unity, as it was in their timeline as well, that'll come up first and dock on the opposite side there. And after that, the first truss will come in. Uh, with that truss, it works pretty much just like the um, International Space Station does. Uh, same idea. In the timeline, they had a little bit more leeway to do more solar panels. Uh, they actually have, at, when the station's fully built, they actually have eight solar panels versus the ISS, which only has four. And for my purposes, you're only going to see me put four on this one. Uh, that, that's because, again, limitations of Kerbal. Uh, with the mods I have available to me, uh, it only look right doing it the way the ISS looks with its solar dresses versus trying to copy the timeline more directly. Uh, yeah, just keep on accelerating. Yeah, it, it takes, takes a little while for this thing to push up into orbit. Uh, but with that, that's specifically only for something this heavy. Um, most of the things I'm going to be launching with the HO3, as you'll see later on, like the solar trusses, th those things get up into orbit a lot quicker, for one, uh, but they also need a lot less to get up there as well. They're not anywhere near as heavy. Uh, but the problem is, and the reason why they're launched on the HO3 versus one of the smaller rockets that you'll also be seeing is because they're just so tall. I believe they're, if I remember correctly, they're about 10 meters in length, uh, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but either way, they require a special fairing that's really, really tall versus really, really wide, uh, like we did with the Challenger module here. Um, so that's why they're launched on the HO3, uh, just because you just need that more power to put something like that into orbit. All right, now we are coming up on first engine cutoff. Uh, now this is something that again only happens in Kerbal Space Program uh, because of the scaled down world that we're playing in. Uh, we can actually perform a gravity turn that ends with me being circularized in my orbit. And the reason for that is it's just because of the scaled down world, that gravity turn. You, you just can't make it efficient enough unless you have a small enough rocket. And ultimately you have to sit there and tweak it to no end as well as the ascent profile to get it to actually work out. And ultimately, that's just a pain to do it, because you'd ultimately have to do that for every single rocket, and it'd be different every time. Which is fairly realistic, but at the same time, for gameplay purposes, it's just a pain in the ass. Yeah, which is why I don't bother. Uh, so now what we're doing is we're coasting to Apoapsis, and we're going to be circularizing uh, right around there. Yeah, you'll notice that in the course of this, the 
uh, stack actually got off on the wrong axis. Uh, once the burn starts, I'll be correcting that so that it's facing the right way up. Uh, now basically as far as how it's supposed to orient itself, uh, just as you see, I'm rotating it. Uh, it orients itself, the radiators, the, at least the one on the Challenger module, needs to be pointed out into space. Uh, so that way you can actually uh, radiate properly. Uh, at least as far as my knowledge, I don't actually know for certain. Uh, but ultimately that's also because the way that the station is going to be built, everything is oriented with this being down. Um, so, so as long as the solar truss sections there, as long as they're actually facing towards the planet, that, that's how it's supposed to be oriented. Uh, and that, that's also how all the docking ports are working as well, because they can only be docked at a certain angle. Uh, it's not like regular Kerbal where you just bump the docking ports together and they're locked. Uh, they actually do require that you needed to have them at a certain angle in order to do it, uh, which is ultimately fine. And it's actually a very good thing to have if you have mods that allow for that, uh, just because it allows you to make sure that your station is actually constructed in a very specific way. All right, we just jettisoned the Challenger. Now, what you're going to see is also something that doesn't happen in, in real life. Uh, what's going to happen with the S4C, it's going to use its remaining Delta V to basically send itself back down to Earth to crash and burn. And what you see there, as I set it to start burning, and then I switch back to Challenger, that is a neat tip for Kerbal if you ever have stages you want to deorbit, but you don't want to have to switch back to what you just launched have it go off and then just switch right back immediately. Still works and until it actually comes out of physics range at 2.3 kilometers it's still burning for all that time. Uh, so unless you're in a really high orbit or it's a really weak rocket uh, it should be able to deorbit itself fairly easily. And now it's ready to go to receive its first crew. We're gonna be launching that very shortly and it will be a separate video. Uh, but yeah, basically the first crew is going to come up and get the station ready. Uh, well, I'm going to role play that they're getting it ready anyway. And then it'll be good to go. They'll be hunkering down for the first month of the station's life, receiving the first node, uh, the first truss segment, and they'll also be doing a couple of EVAs to install some things on the station, as well as getting the truss ready to go. Uh, we'll be seeing all that in future videos, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed this first little video of my series, where we're going to be building the station. It should be really fun, and like I said, hope you all enjoyed it.